Okay, Frank Bernardo here, and with me today is a man whose voice is synonymous with UK MMA. Uh, it's Mr. Bradley Wharton. How are you, man? I'm very good, thank you, mate. Um, I, I think I remember last time we did this, I'd had an absolute nightmare. I'd had like a bad hair day, hair day or something, and pretty much the exact same things happened today. And uh, <laughs> to make matters worse, jam my finger in the door on the way out of the bathroom as well. So I'm starting to think you're bad news, my friend. I'm very sorry, but <laughs> what is good news is that we've got Cage Warriors Double Trouble coming up. Um, that is good news. <laughs> yeah, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and we will go over that in a second. Um, however, first, uh, I'd like to go over, um, well, some, I suppose, Cage Warriors alumni, former guys who have, um, you know, built up their career in Cage Warriors and, um, you know, have I've made that step to, well, to the US. Um, especially Ian Gary, uh, a guy that we spoke about last time you were on. I think he had just won the welterweight title against Jack Grant. Um, and yeah, one of the th first things I asked you was, um, do you think uh, Gary is ready for that step up immediately? Would you like to see him defend his belt? Uh, and you actually said, yeah, maybe one more title defense or one title defense in the first place and then take the step over. But he didn't. He made the set. He gone to Samford, I think. Samford MMA. Um, made his UFC debut, UFC 268 against Jordan Williams. Um, won by a KO. A little bit shaky at the start. Um, do you think maybe if he had have had that one extra fight uh, at Cage Warriors, that would have been a little bit different? Uh, you know, who, who knows, man? It, it's, it's tough to say. I think, uh, you know, obviously there, there's been a whole lot going on with Ian. He's uh, he's uprooted his life. He's moved to the US. Obviously, he's, uh, you know, settled into Sanford MMA now. And it's the UFC, right? You know, you, you can be as confident and as fully yourself as you like. But when you get there and you've got those bright lights on you for the first time, it can take a bit of getting used to. You know, it won't be the first time we've seen, you know, a, a prospect you know, not go in there and look like they're ready for a title shot straight away. You know, it, it happens. And look, the guy's 24 years old now, right? I think he was, I think he was 23 when he won the belt, 24 now. Uh, he's literally got his whole career in front of him. And I think, you know, maybe going through that little bit of adversity, didn't that ever look like he was in trouble in that no. fight? Let's be honest. He got, got hit a few times. It's a fist fight. It's going to happen, right? <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, maybe that maybe that's the best thing in the world for him, you know? it's uh, I'm sure it, it's grounded him, but... Uh, the most important thing was that he was able to stay calm, not panic, not go into, you know, fight or flight mode, remain composed and land an absolutely, you know, picture perfect shot to end the fight. Still got his highlight reel knockout yeah. uh, at the end of the day. And, you know, I think people are going to be, you know, even more intrigued now. You know, I, I think, we, you know, we, we maybe talked about it last time as well. You know, he's, he's going to have a, a big groundswell of support. And as you get with any popular fighter, he's probably going to be a bit polarizing as well. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, the, the people who want to see him lose are going to be like, oh, you know, he got hit a few times in that fight. Is he going to get hit a few times in the next one? I'll tune in. And the people who are behind him are going to tune in to, uh, to see his success. So, you know, I, I, I certainly think uh, it was a great debut for him. Wish him all the best. And uh, I, as a fan, I'm looking forward to his next fight. It was, you know, it was exciting. That's what you want, right? 100%. Yeah. I, I think with Gary, for me, um, <laughs> I must confess, I am somewhat, even though I'm in MMA media and all that, I am somewhat of a new fan to Cage Warriors. Uh, I suppose I found it about three or four years ago. Um, so Gary's been that sort of first guy that I've been able to watch come up through the ranks, make a name for himself, and then take that step to the UFC, um, which I think is, <laughs> I've been looking for someone to do that for, for quite a long time. And um yeah, he seems like that full package. Actually, yeah, who's the one guy um, over your, uh, well, time as a fan and as a commentator who you've enjoyed most um, watching from the very start of their career, make it all the way up to, to the very top of the sport? There's been there's been a few to be honest. Um, you know, I'm really I'm really lucky in, in the fact that I, I do a lot of work on the regional scene, yeah. so I, I get to commentate on a lot of amateur fights as well. Um, you know, like someone like Molly McCann, for example, I mm. called Molly's amateur fights. Um, you know, I called uh, one of her first pro title wins uh, down on the South Coast, uh, which was just after she um, she lost her, uh, I believe, it was her stepfather. That was a really emotional uh, evening. Um, you know, we were both kind of filling up during the post fight interview in the cage. Um, 
And then obviously got to call a Cage Warriors fight, it's a Cage Warriors title fight, and then uh, saw her go on to the UFC. And I was um, I was lucky enough to be cage side uh, during that uh, incredible UFC fight she had in London, that big three round war. And you know, lucky enough to be kind of like the first person to uh, to to give her a hug as she as she left the cage. So sort of seeing Molly win is always fantastic. She's such a, an amazing person, such an inspirational person. Um, and, you know, seeing someone live their dreams like that is phenomenal. Uh, but, you know, in truth, I could probably sit here all day and, yeah. and reel off like 10, 15 people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky to be in the position I'm in. And, and the best thing about it is I'm seeing guys now at amateur level and thinking, yep, yeah, five years time, we'll be seeing you winning Cage Warriors titles, winning Bellator titles or, or going on to the UFC. Um, another guy who, well, I suppose linked to Molly, um, is of course Paddy Pimblett. The uh, saying that I, I said, um, maybe I didn't start watching Cage Warriors properly until uh, you know, three or four years ago. Paddy Pimblett was the one guy that I definitely knew about way before. Um, just, just he's just got that that thing, hasn't he? Um, and he's finally signed to the UFC, made his debut against Luigi Vendor- Vendramini um, at um, what UFC Till versus Brunson. I can't remember which Vegas one it was. But um, yeah, what did you make of his, his debut? Because I suppose in a way, somewhat similar to Gary, he did get clipped early on. Um, to be honest, he was, I don't know if he was in more trouble than Gary, but it was a bigger moment where it was like, whoa, um, is he in trouble here? And then obviously... Turns it around, gets the KO finish. Well, you know, Paddy is the absolute dictionary definition of a polarizing fighter, right? <laughs> there's no, uh, there's no mild opinions on Paddy Pim, but you either love him or you hate him. Either way, you're going to tune in to watch him win or lose, right? And uh, and you know that that was uh, a dramatic debut, and it, you know it's one that's going to have guys on both sides of the fence probably quite happy about watching this next fight as well. You know, there's a lot of people. Um, you know, now who want to see Paddy get stopped. And there's a lot of people who are going to be on the bandwagon. But I, I've always been on the Paddy bandwagon. I, I've known Paddy since he was about 15 years old and, you know, calling out blokes on the amateur circuit in the UK uh, and beating them all. Um, he's, a, you know, again, you know, he, he, he's a great guy. It's been great to watch his journey. Um, don't get me wrong, man. I think he nearly gave me a heart attack in that UFC debut. I was, uh, I was about to flip our coffee table over in the front room watching that fight. My uh, my missus had to tell the neighbours that um, everything was okay afterwards because I was doing a lot of shouting and swearing. But you know that's uh, that's what it's like when you're emotionally invested in these guys. And I think you know Paddy's got all the uh, certainly got all the ingredients both in the cage and outside of it to get people emotionally invested in his fights. You know, there's uh, everyone's talking about him in, in a positive or negative way, and at, at the end of the day, that's going to make him a whole lot of money. Already has and. Uh, you know, hopefully um, things will continue for him both inside and outside of the cage. And, uh, you know, he's going to get a very good life for everything he's put into fighting so far. Yeah, <laughs> I know exactly what you mean when you say uh, that moment in the cage and stuff. Like I was watching it because obviously it was at UK Times. I, I, I think my dad and my brother were around as well. Not normally UFC fans. They saw that. They saw the whole fight, saw the post-fight interview. And my dad's like, there's something about that lad, isn't there? There's something about him. And yeah, you can see why he gets people talking. Um, you know, I remember like back when he was headlining the Echo Arena events in mm-hmm. Liverpool, and you know, I obviously get a train up to Liverpool from London a couple of days before, jump straight in a taxi, and the taxi drivers knew him, and that's kind of like <laughs> that's the litmus test for fame, right? You know, if if you're if you go to someone's city and the taxi drive, you know, what you're here for, and you tell them, and the taxi drives like, oh. That's the Paddy Pimblet fight. You know you've made it then because you know the man on the streets talking about you. You know Paddy was up on all the billboards, um, and even even then, kind of four years ago, five years ago, he he was a star. And you know that's why I often say to people, it's not it's not a race to the UFC. Of course, when the UFC come knocking on your door, it's a different kettle of fish. It's it's very difficult to turn that opportunity down. I know Paddy did turn it down a couple of times. You know he made that gamble and it paid off for him. I think. The Paddy Pimlet we're seeing in the UFC now is much more prepared, both inside and outside the cage, uh, for that UFC experience and for that UFC career. I think, you know, had he gone four years ago, you know, who, who knows what might have happened. But the, the fact is, he's still in his mid-20s. He's still got the prime of his life, the prime of his career ahead of him. And, you know, it, it all just seems to have slotted into place perfectly for Paddy. Yeah, hopefully we'll see him on that. Um I think the UFC are targeting a March card, um, 
be great to see his, his second March fight. 18th or 19th or something. Something it's the third like weekend in March. Yeah, yeah, we've already got, I think, Tom Aspinall's on there, Jack Shaw. Should be a good one. Um, the worst kept secret in MMA, isn't it? <laughs> uh, put, the, uh, put the old to a ringer for that date. Here, I hear another promotion might be putting on a show that same weekend as well. So oh, really? You heard it here first, maybe. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, okay, one last thing before we do um, start talking about Double Trouble. Um, Cage Warriors has been doing great work uh, in the US this year, especially. Um, uh, and some quite big names over there as well, like former UFC fighters, um, I think Spike Kyle Isle, Max Ropskoff, I think his name was, the guy who um, was billed as one of the big prospects, quit on the stool, but then came back and has looked incredible. Do you reckon um, we ever see uh, maybe even like a crossover card? You know, you have all UK fighters versus US, something like that. Do you reckon that's possible at all? Yeah, I mean, look, anything's possible. I think uh, at the moment, probably not due to the mm, situation yeah, that yeah. the world's in. Um, it's very difficult to get guys into the US at the moment. It's very expensive as well. Uh, you know, you have to have uh, work permits, visas. Uh, you know, it, it, even in normal times, it's a lengthy, complicated process. Um, but obviously, in, in, in the current times we're in, it, it's very difficult. Mm. So I, I would say, you know, don't, don't be looking at, you know, maybe March, April next year for some kind of crossover event. But I think down the line, you know, why not? I know Graham Boylan has come out in the past and said, you know, there's not going to be two sets of Cage Warriors champions. You know, whether the plans have changed since because of what's going on, who knows? But I know he he has said publicly in the past there won't be, you know, an American Cage Warriors middleweight champion and a European middleweight champion. So I'm sure, you know, somewhere down the line, there's going to be some crossover. Look, you know, we, we've had guys from the US, many guys from the US uh, compete on cage drawers before. Yeah. We've had American champions like Jesse Taylor, Jim Allers, who's a, a long, long reigning champion here at Cage Warriors. So uh, I, I think anything's possible, um, you know, when the world's kind of got a bit more back to normal, hopefully, you know, by some point in, in the next year, that's something that they'll, yeah. they'll be looking at. But you know, if you keep an eye on uh, on Graham's Twitter, there's always, uh, you know, a few little tidbits on there. And he said that 2022 is going to be uh, perhaps the busiest year in Cage Warriors history. Um, you know, I know he's planning on putting on a lot of events uh, in America. And, and uh, I believe he mentioned going back to the motherland as well, which obviously is, is Ireland for him. So mm-hmm. it's going to be great to see Cage Warriors traveling again. 100%. All right, let's get to it. Um, Cage Warriors, Double Trouble, first event. 131 um headlining event matt bonner versus the Dejat- jatty milan i believe the name is um bonner uh veteran of cage warriors by now um and won his title last time out milan won fight in cage warriors like i think it was was it 2017 around that time um which is to be honest the only fight full fight i've been able to see of him he's quite hard to find some of his footage um obviously everyone knows bono at this point uh what do you make of this this matchup um i, I imagine as a commentator you you've done your homework on me limb properly um yeah what do you make of the fight yeah, you know, the interesting thing with Milan is he's uh, he's a real enigma like you say there's um there's not a massive amount of uh, footage out there of him uh, and that's typical for a lot of guys who've come up you know yeah. through the french french circuit they've had to fight on um, you know, either very small shows or they're traveling over Europe to get the experience in. Um, the, the one thing about this guy is, uh, you know, he was very, very highly touted when he first fought on Cage Warriors a few years back. Uh, you know, people out in France were saying, you know, this this guy is one to watch. The negative for him over the past few years is that he's just not been able to get fights in. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, MMA has only very recently become legal in France. We've had the whole issue with coronavirus, and I believe he's had some issues with injuries as well, which, which kept him out for extended periods. Um, so there's a lot of question marks uh, about him. You know, on the plus side, you know, you could think he's going to be very well rested. He's not going to be carrying the kind of niggling injuries that someone like Bonner, who's competed very regularly over yeah. the past 18 months and in some really tough fights, might might be carrying in. You know, Bonner's been in some you know, three round wars and, you know, that wild fight with Natias. Um, you know, not to say that he's injured or anything, but, you know, if you have that strength of schedule, you're going to pick up little knocks. Every, every fighter does. So I think there's kind of enough on both sides of the scale to say, 
you know, may, maybe that that long break, uh, you know, cancels out the activity that Matt's had. And look, who knows how much he's been able to level up in that time as well. You know, you, you see guys sometimes take a year or so off, uh, you know, go training in different places, improve in various parts of their skill set, and they come back looking like a different fighter. I guess one thing that Matt won't be able to do is much scouting. You know, the, yeah. the, there's just not the footage out there. And who knows? Uh, like we say, who knows what kind of skill set he's going to bring into this contest. So there's a lot of intrigue in this one for me. Um, you know, Bonner is an absolute stud. His run through the trilogy series has been incredible. You know, and you think he started 2020, he was 6-6-1. Six, six and one. Now he's a world champion with 10 wins. Um, and he's one of the most durable guys out there. Never been finished, right? So um, I think if Milan's coming into this fight thinking he's going to make a statement about Matt Bonner, that might not be the easiest thing in the world to do. 100%. Uh, in a way, um, what are you saying about uh, his run through the trilogy time? Uh, alludes to what I've said earlier with, with Ian Gary, you know, like following someone for the majority of their career all the way up. Just um, Bonner's work over the past two years alone is, is a good chunk of his career. So I feel like a lot of people have got to know him over that time and, and, He's obviously capped it all off with um, with, with the title win over uh, Natias, um, which was an interesting fight in itself. I felt like a lot of people thought Natias was going to win. There seemed to be a narrative on social media that he was uh, one win away from a tie, uh, from a UFC contract, uh, considering his age and, so, and whatnot. But it was just a narrative that it was yeah, it was his time to put a stamp on his cage warrior's career and move on. And then Bonner comes in and um get, gets the upset win um which was was really impressive I, I i personally thought yeah absolutely you know um i think a lot of people have made the mistake of underestimating matt before um matt's another guy i, I was calling his amateur fights um i actually called uh called a card where him and his twin brother fought one yeah. fight after the other. And uh, that was very confusing because <laughs> uh, they are, they're identical twins and they have the same hair and, uh, and everything at the time. So that was, that was weird. Um, but, you know, seeing that progress he's made and the thing about Matt is every fight at amateur and every fight at pro, he's never taken an easy fight. He, you know, he, he could have quite easily not ended up with that, six uh you know six losses in 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 the l column if he'd taken easier fights and, and you know he, he kind of turned fights down um and you know built himself back up a little bit more um but he didn't want to do that he always wanted to fight the toughest guys and when you fight the toughest opponent out there every time you're going to win some you're going to lose some uh it's obviously all come together he's moved to next generation uh everything's clicked for him and, and he's put a career best run together so I would um I would certainly caution anyone against underestimating Matt Bonner. 100 percent Um let's move on to the co-main event. Uh one of the fights I'm probably looking forward to the most on on, on the entire uh double series. Um George Hardwick versus Medi Ben Lakdar for the vacant lightweight title. Uh George Hardwick has burst onto the scene um this year, I think. Was he formerly in Bellator, I believe? Um, yeah, and then and then came in with that that body shot uh, TKO or KO of Dean Truman, which was oh, I remember watching that. I felt like I felt that, you know, uh, and follows it up with the um, guillotine submission uh, at Code Warriors one two nine. Um, very excited for for Hardwick, uh, both of the brothers actually uh, exciting people. Then Medi Ben Lakdar previously was set to fight Sadari, I think it was for the title. Um, that unfortunately fell apart. He was also meant to fight Red Sir as well, which uh, didn't come together. But Ben Lakdar is considered, you know, he's one of the big prospects in Cage Warriors, I think, um, against one of the new big prospects. Uh, what a fight! Yeah, ab absolutely, and um. You know, there's a there's a couple of interesting things going on here because obviously Ben Lakdar had that crazy, uh, I think it was a split draw against Joe McColgan, mm. who was the lightweight champion. You know, Joe's had to obviously vacate. He's got a lot of stuff going on outside the cage um, and he didn't want to hold the division up. But I, I believe the plan is for him to, uh, when he is able to come back uh, sometime um, towards the middle of next year, he's going to fight for the belt straight away. So... You know, potentially if Medi wins, we're going to get a rematch of one of the best fights I've ever called. 
Um, and if George wins, and that's a fresh fight, which again is uh, is really intriguing. And I think you know Joe McColgan versus anyone is always going to be a good fight. <laughs> and you could say the same for for Medi, and you could say the same for Hardwick. Um, they're very entertaining fighters. Uh, I think their styles match up very well. Hardwick, you know, he can be quite awkward, quite difficult to read. Medi has got this really, really uh, tight boxing game. He's got a lot of boxing experience that, uh, you know, he once told me he likes to keep the footage as far away from the internet as possible. So, uh, so people can't, uh, can't scout him. Um, but you know, he's got a, uh, he's got a veteran head, um, on young shoulders as well. So I think this has got all the ingredients to be, uh, an, an absolute barnstormer. And I think, you know, th- this, this would be the main event of any other cage warriors card of the year. Obviously, you know, we're trying to stack the deck again to get as many people out as possible before the end of the year. But this is a huge fight. You know, Hardwick's come onto the scene with his brother um, during the trilogy series. has become, you know, they both have, uh, as, alongside the Figlax, they've become kind of like breakout stars for Cage Warriors. And, you know, we thought that it would probably be, you know, next year that there's, there's no reason that any of those four brothers couldn't be challenging for a title. And uh, it just so happens that he's getting his shot early. But, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one. Yes, definitely. Yeah, could be the the birth of a, a new superstar. Really, could be. Um, and then oh, with a fight with Joe McColgan lined up, you you can't complain. <laughs> um, one more fight I want to specifically look at on this card: uh, Oban Elliott versus Madars Flaminus, I believe. Yeah, Flaminus. Uh, Flaminus. He fought Jack Grant, didn't he, for the wealth in the welterweight tournament? Um, yeah, Elli- yeah, Elliott. Um, uh, well, I'm, I, I've got like a personal bias to, to pretty much any Welsh fighter. I'm not Welsh myself, but I, I've trained in a Welsh gym. Um, I, I've grown up in Wales. So anytime I see a guy walking out with the dragon flag, I'm, I'm completely biased towards their side. Um, but yeah, is this, do you think uh, sort of the, I, I know Flaminus is still is it just about 11 fights on his record or so, but the prospect sort of against a veteran because Flaminus has fought relatively high level of competition for a good amount of time yeah. now. Um, so yeah. Vet- yeah prospect- Flamin- veteran- Flaminus is, um, he, he's a tough out man. He's, you know, very few people get by Flaminus quickly. Uh, you know, he got caught in that uh, grappling exchange with Jack. Yeah. Um, but he is an awkward, awkward fighter. You know, his, his stand up is, it's just really weird. You know, it's really unorthodox. His movement is really unorthodox. It's quite difficult to get a read on. Um, but, you know, in terms of like a styles make fights perspective, Oban is a very, very good boxer. So you've got to think if there's anyone who can you know get a read on an awkward stand up fighter, it's going to be a guy who's good at zeroing in on those openings and getting his punches through. Um, it's a big step up for Oban. Uh, I, I would say that this is, um, you know, at the time it's happening, it's toughest fight to date, I think. You know, Figlax obviously, you know, moved uh, onwards and upwards now and, and is considered a legitimate prospect. Uh, but I think, you know, they, they were both kind of quite early in their pro careers a couple of years back when, when they originally fought. So I would say that in terms of where both guys are now, this is the toughest test for Oban yet. But that's what he wants, you know. He's um, obviously had his, uh, his well-documented health concerns over the past couple of years and there was thoughts that he might have to retire And, you know, he wanted to come back and make a statement and, you know, anyone that had maybe forgotten about him or was overlooking him, um, you know, he wanted to make people eat the words and he he did. He got that incredible knockout victory. And I'm I'm sure he could have probably said, you know, I want another guy who's maybe like, you know, five and three or five and two or something. But instead, he, he, he wants the guy that's, you know, known to be kind of maybe a gatekeeper to the top of the division, if you like. Um, he wants he wants the toughest challenges out there and he wants to make a mark on this welterweight division. And obviously, you know, with, with Ian going, uh, the belt's vacant, so there's going to be a lot of guys uh, want to throw their hat in the ring to to be fighting for that title at some point over the next 12 months. And, you know, if Oban can get a win here and uh, a couple of wins early next year, you know, who's to say by the end of the year he might be that guy? And, uh, you know, I think that you could say a similar thing about Flaminas as well, you know. He's um, certainly not to be counted out here. And, you know he's going to give anyone in that division a, a really awkward, uh, a really awkward fifteen minutes if it comes down to it. So, you know he, he's also in a position where he has dropped a couple of fights to guys at the top of that division. So he's going to be, you know, fighting for relevancy and fighting to say, well, you know, I'm not the gatekeeper. I still can capture this cage warriors goal. One hundred percent. 
it, those are the three fights that really stick out to me the most. Um, any other fights on this first card that uh, you're looking forward to? Well, not only watching, but also calling. Yeah, man. John and Doyle versus uh, Tom Means is going to be wild. Um, mm -hmm. You know, look, Tom has not had the best run of results on Cage Warriors, but he has had some incredible fights. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, pretty much everything that Tom does ends up in a bloody war. Um, you know, he went to the Cage Warriors Academy show recently, um, got a really good win there, and uh, and now he's back on the big show. You know, crucially different this time is that he's competing as a featherweight. He's been competing as, as a, a lightweight on Cage Warriors over the past couple of years. Talking to his coach, Danny Batten, um, you know, one, one of the original Cage Warriors champions, and, you know, that was because he... He didn't have the time, uh, you know, in, in terms of work-life balance to actually dedicate himself to, to getting down to 145 pounds, uh, uh, you know, safely in good condition there. So he was kind of just competing at his walk-around weight. Um, you know, he's obviously had to make that decision now that he's going to drop down to 145 pounds. That's where his team think he's best. Um, so, you know, if anything, you're going to see him a little bit faster with even more cardio. And, you know, we know he can take a shot and we know he can dish him out too. John and Doyle is one of the most exciting guys in the division. Um, he's going to be a contender for fight of the night anytime you see him out there. Um, you know, another veteran guy, a guy who's been around the, the game a long time, like Tom has. Um, and, you know, another guy who's going to be looking for another uh, highlight reel win to get himself noticed on this weekend and get himself, you know, considered uh, back in sort of the, the top end of those cage warriors for the weight rankings, which are, you know, pretty hectic at the moment. There's a lot of guys, you know, who could lay claim yeah. to being, you know, the best fighter in that division. You know, you've, you've got uh, you've got Paul Jordan and, and Morgan Charrier. And I think, you know, if those two guys fought each other in kind of a round robin tournament over and over again, you'd see a lot of different outcomes. Um, so there's a lot of guys chasing that pack. Uh, and Jean's one of those guys. So very interested to see this one. It's going to be a brawl. Definitely. Also, Liam Gittins uh, against, is it Kingsley Crawford? Um, yeah, yeah, that that should be a banger as well. I'm a big fan of Liam Gittins. Um, but let's move on to the second event, one, three, two. Uh, Dominic Wooding, Carlos Abreu. Um, Wooding won the bantamweight title last time out. I'm not gonna lie, I was like, I was watching Paddy Pimblitz, um, podcasts and all that, and I got on the Nathan Fletcher hype train pretty much. I, I was expecting him to go in there and 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 run through uh wooding um which is not a mistake i'm gonna make again because um you know wooding uh he weathered the early storm um and then just put that end that finishing sequence at the end was was just incredible to be honest um he takes on carlos abreu who i believe this is cage warrior's debut yeah um i i'm not gonna lie again it's another guy that i'm not particularly familiar with um uh, have you got any, uh, yeah, uh, like, do you want to spread some light on um, on, on Carlos Abreu? Well, look, it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's any secret that this fight has been announced quite recently. Yeah. And uh, it, it has not been easy to find an opponent for Dominic Wooding for this card. Um, you know, I, I, I think Dominic said on Twitter himself that uh, there's been a few guys yeah, uh, who we've seen on Cage Warriors before who've turned the fight down. Um you know, look, it's uh, when, when you see him go out there and beat a hot prospect like Nathan Fletcher, undefeated as a pro, uh, and do it in that kind of fashion, you know, all of a sudden, uh, everyone kind of with their hand up, piping up for the next title shot, maybe maybe takes a step back <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, just sees what, what plays out. The thing, the thing with Dom is, you know, he, he's a guy who's been around the scene a long time as well. You know, he's had some uh, really big fights at amateur. He put an incredible amateur record together. Uh, a time when the sort of the, the lower weight classes at amateur that he was competing in were uh, an absolute lion's den. So he's got a lot of experience. And, you know, I, I think as a pro, he, he was given fights very early in his pro career that a lot of uh, other young pros wouldn't have taken or wouldn't have even been offered. Uh, you know, fighting guys like Andy Young when he, he's just a few mm -hmm. fights in for, for a Driscoll title. As well, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, he's he, he's had that big fight experience and that's really what carried him through against Nathan Fletcher. You know, his, his patience to have faith in himself, have faith in his abilities that he can defend that takedown, that he can wait for the opening. And when the opening comes, he's able to uh, to capitalize on it. Um, look, Abreu is a tough guy. He's been around the circuit. Um, obviously, he's coming in 
on uh, reasonably late notice. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, how well prepared he is. Uh, I'm not sure if he was preparing for another fight or not. Um, presumably, you know, he, he feels like it's an opportunity he, he can capitalise on. Um, he's got a good win over Chris Mia, who was, uh, I, I believe, um, number one contender in Cage Warriors before he sort of, he, he kind of semi-retired. And I believe he's kind of come back out of retirement semi since as well. Um, so, you know, a win over Mia is, uh, you know, is, is very valuable in, in, in terms of seeing where a guy is skill set wise. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't imagine he's going to want to bang it out with winning. I, I, I don't think that'd be a wise course of action for any bounce <laughs> and weight uh, in Europe at the moment. Um, so it might come down to his gamesmanship and, uh, and, and his ring craft, you know, can, can he, can he find a way to, uh, to get on the inside and, and get around Wooding? Um, you know, look at anyone who can considering taking Wooding down is going to have to be very careful with the knees and elbows as well. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'm predicting a bit of a chess match here. Um, what I'm interested to see as well is, uh, I don't know how it came across on TV, but in the arena when, uh, Wooding fought Fletcher, it was a pro Fletcher crowd. You, you know, could tell Wooding that. Was, you could hundred percent tell that. Wooding yeah. was, uh, you know, was was booed heavily. There was a lot of scouts in that building. So I think we're going to see maybe, uh, you know, a more kind of uh, Wooding focused crowd this time. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of the fans who were maybe undecided are going to be on the bandwagon now. Yeah. They love to see those uh, those big finishes. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see if he's got the crowd behind him and uh, if that affects his opponent at all. Yeah, I I, I remember watching it and. Um... It was every time Fletcher lifted Wooding up for one of those like slams, the whole crowd went up instantly. Um, so yeah, it, it should be an interesting one. I'm yeah, I do feel like with that win, my focus has gone on to Wooding like a lot, you know, narrower now. I'm looking at him like shit. This is this guy's got something. Flyweight championship in the co-main event, um, a rematch: Sam Creasy versus Lou Shanks. San Creasy, was it a yeah, guillotine submission um, to beat Shanks in the first fight? Um, I'm a big fan of San Creasy. Uh, one of the nicest guys I've ever interviewed, full stop, and um, a very sort of cerebral martial artist, I think. Um, I'm a big fan of his style. It comes out like, um, looks like a very traditional mixed martial art. Uh, no traditional martial artist. Um, but then he's also got that wrestling base, or not base, but just skill set that he can just throw people around uh, if it comes to it. Um, taking on Luke Shanks, who uh, he's come so close so many times, I think, um, to, to really realizing his potential. Um, now, the, I, I think maybe a, a factor in this rematch is, is obviously the um, was it a tap or not from, from Creasy um, in the first fight. Um, I'm not sure where I stand on it, to be honest. It looked like possibly, but also possibly not. Uh, Creasy's denied it. Shanks has said, yeah, it probably was. Um, but either way, it, it should be a good fight. Um, I'm not complaining that we got a rematch. Um, yeah, what do you make of it? Did you think it was a tap? Do you, uh, what did you think of the first fight? Well, first of all, I didn't see it live. Yeah. I, 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 I didn't, didn't even I. see... Uh, I, I, I saw what looked like a close armbar attempt... Hmm. And Creasy getting out. And obviously, uh, Dan Strauss next to me had kind of, you know, he was instantly on like, oh, that was close, but he's got out. And obviously, I've seen footage, which I don't think is official Cage Warriors footage. I no. think it's, you know, maybe it's from someone, uh, one of the corner team, um, where he does it like a tap. Um, so there's a couple of schools of thought. I mean, yeah, the one, one, one school of thought is that there was a submission. The other school of thought is the last instruction that you get from the referee is fight until I tell you to stop. Yeah. Um, so, you know, from, from that point of view, there's an argument that Luke Shanks should have held on to the armbar until the referee had fully intervened. Um, look, these things happen. Referees have to make crazy split second decisions in the middle of uh, a chaotic situation. Um, Dan's a very good referee. Um, you know, I, I've got 100% faith in him to, to always do the right thing. And, you know, look, at the end of the day, he has to make a decision based on what he saw. He can't make a decision based on what he thinks he saw or what he might have seen. And he's got a very short window to do that in. So 
look, it's just one of those controversial things. It happens in a sport where there's so many factors at play. Um, obviously, you've got the situation as well where, you know, Shank miss, Shanks missed weight uh, for that fight. He wasn't yes. eligible to win the belt anyway, uh, which is just another kind of wrinkle to the saga, you know. I, I, I think, um, you know, the feeling was that, that he was going to have to move up to bantamweight at, le- at least for a fight or two uh, and, until, you know, he, he was able to, uh, you know, figure out a way to make the weight more comfortably or, or whether he was going to settle at bantamweight. Obviously, with things happening the way it did, both guys have said, look, let's run it back. Um, but you've got to believe there's some pressure on Shanks now. Like, he can't miss weight for this one, right? You know, that mm. that will be absolutely disastrous. Um, so I'm sure that's, you know, in his mind, you know, he, he's got a... Um, He's got a huge opportunity here that he might not otherwise have got. Um, but look, I was really happy to see Sam Creasy win the belt. Um, he's fought for the belt twice before, lost in the third round both times, won in the third round uh, on that occasion. And, you know, again, he's, he's been around the Cage Warriors flyweight division for a long time. And, you know, he, the only guys he's lost to were Cage Warriors champions. So he, he's a top level operator. Um, I've got no issues with seeing this fight again. Uh, it was a lot of fun last time. I think it'll be a lot of fun this time. And, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, we put the controversy to bed. 100%. Do you reckon this is one of those where I did speak with Creasy before his win and he said, you know, uh, winning the title and one title defence and I reckon uh, I might be off to the UFC. Um, do, do you think that's the sort of route he's going to look for or... Is he like maybe like another title defense, properly like secure his place uh, as a reigning champion in, um, you know, a contra- controversy free champion um, in Cage Warriors? Because um, he's getting to the sort of latter half of his career, I think. Um, yeah, 33, which, yeah, I think he's probably got at least, well, a few more years of his prime, certainly. But um, you know how mixed martial arts can take a toll on someone. Do you reckon we see him in the you know following the footsteps of, of Jake Hadley and and those guys making move up to the UFC in the near future if he gets the win? Look, I, I think you know it doesn't really need saying that the the vast majority of the Cage Warriors roster are looking to get to yeah. the UFC. Yeah, you yeah. know, we have been the, the premier route through European MMA to the UFC. Um, you know, for the past. Man, I don't know how long it's been now. Nearly, we're, well, we're, we're nearly 20 years now, right? Mm. We're, we're 20, 20 years next year. So um, I think if you're stood in the middle of a cage with a, a cage where his belt over your shoulder and you're not shooting your shot, you know, wh- what are you there for? Yeah. Um, but like like you say, you know, Sam's going to want to to come out and, you know, put any, any, root, any talk of controversy to bed. You know, he, he's going to want to do that in dramatic fashion. Um, the UFC have kind of restocked the flyweight division over the past few years, but there's been quite a few new signings recently. Yeah. So, you know, it could be the, the case that a win in and of itself isn't enough. It's going to be something crazy. It's going to get people talking. You know, a lot of people um, have been talking about the likes of um, Mohamed Mikhaev yeah. for a long time. A lot of people talk about Jake Hadley because, you know, he's got that persona on social media that, you know, people, again, you know, like we talked about guys like Paddy, people love him or people love to hate him. I think Sam, you know, like you say, he's more of a more of a quiet guy, does his talking in the cage. Um, so I'm sure he's going to be looking for something spectacular. You know, and, and for Shanks as well, he's been to the top of the mountain. He had uh, an incredibly dominant win over Samir Fadeen. Um, and then obviously things did not go well for him against Jake Hadley. So he's looking for that win now to reestablish himself. Uh, you know, he, he's a bit younger than Sam. Um, he's probably got a little bit more time to, you know, hit that peak. But every fight's a big fight now. When you're in that spotlight, when you're fighting for the belt, these are the fights people remember. You know, if you if you lose on the undercard, get a few wins later and everyone's forgotten all about it. But if you're in the main event, you're in the fight that is going to be, you know, on the front page of MMA Junkie or, or wherever, wherever else the next day. If you're losing those fights, people remember that. So mm. uh, big, big opportunity for both these guys to uh, to put that last fight behind them and make a huge impression. 100%. Also, it looks like, Makaya Van Hadley uh, 
biting at the bit to potentially get a matchup between the two of them. Which, we have wanted to oh, fight each other for a long time. <laughs> man, imagine that fight though. Oof. I, I kind of don't want it to happen because I think they're both such good <laughs> ambassadors for UK MMA in the UFC. I don't want to see either of them lose, but it would be a good one. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I, I remember um, Makayev turning up in a, an event and he must have been literally just 16 mm. and just suplexing this dude all over <laughs> the place and it was like wow this this kid's this kid's for real um you know when you see a, when you you turn up to a regional show in bolton and you see a guy from dagestan on the card you, you <laughs> uh you know you know you're uh you're into something special and he certainly lived up to that and look so is jake you know yeah. great amateur consummate pro smashing everybody um like i'm very much like you i I don't want to see them fight in March. I'd love to see them get a couple of wins under their belt and maybe, you know, may, maybe fight down the line. I think it'll probably get to the stage with those two. If they do keep winning, they're going to be giving each other so much needle on social media. The UFC will kind of, uh, kind of be forced to, uh, to put them in with each other. So yeah, ho- hopefully down the line. And I- I'm glad it's going to happen if it does happen in the UFC as well, because mm-hmm. it's the kind of fight that both guys deserve to make, you know, a, a lot of money for and, and do it on a big platform. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll get to see it somewhere down the line. Yeah. It's the sort of fight that also should have as many eyes on it as possible, just because um, they are such high level fighters. Um, I'm looking at the rest of this card and, it's hard to pick out because I was trying to do three big fights from uh, from each card, but we've got uh, Mateus Biglack versus Kent Kopanen. Kopanen? Kopanen. Yeah. Kopanen. Sounds like this, a... this is really interesting. So this yeah. is Kent's debut at welterweight. Um, he's he's fought as high as light heavy. Yeah, I was going to say light heavy um, at Bellator against yeah, Melvin Manhoff <laughs> again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know he's. Uh, He's got a lot of boxing experience as well. Um, I know she's fought middleweight and cage warriors coming off that debut win over Jamie Richardson, who's a former title challenger. Uh, so in, I was really surprised to see him drop down to welterweight because he looked like, you know, he had no issues whatsoever in terms of uh, his ability or his size at middleweight. He looked absolutely fine. So uh, interesting to see this one as well. Look, Figlaps, obviously, uh, yeah. you know, both Figlap brothers are okay. on the rise and, this is a great test. Uh, you know, if you want to be challenging for titles, you want to be beating guys like Kent Kalpanen, who is going to, is going to be in there giving it to you for three hard rounds. So this is a, this is a huge fight for Figlak. Um, this, this is going to be a real litmus test for him. And we're going to see just how much he's improved against a long-time combat sports veteran. And, you know, for Kent, he's coming off one big winning cage warriors. If he can, you know, ice a prospect here, well, look, put your hand up man and 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 shout for that title shot because i think at middleweight you know he might have even got a title shot he, he or, or at the very least been one fight away so i'm sure if he can uh, if he can beat figlack he's going to be putting his hand up for a title shot and i'm sure figlack will be doing the exact same thing if he gets his hand raised too uh, cage warriors well weight division is a it's got a couple of contenders going at the moment hasn't it um Tobias Harilla is a guy who absolutely terrifies me. I, I follow the man on social media and it's just, I don't know, there's something about him. He's got that sort of cold killer look about him. Um, now, he did come up short uh, last time out. Uh, yeah, William Gomez, which was a great fight in itself. Um, I thought Harilla uh, carried himself very well in defeat, was um, very clear about making changes to his game, not making the, like learning from his, the mistakes he made, not just following the whole time and trying to like pressure and whatnot, you know, learning from that, changing and becoming a, a better combatant, I suppose. Um, so he's taking on Jair Jr., a uh, Brazilian lad, uh, one fight in Bellator and then a lot of regional uh, glory of heroes come and fight gladiator cf uh, i'm not familiar with these events in all honesty but um yeah i'm excited to see harilla uh do you know anything about jair well look you know these events that he's fought on um he's been fighting all over the world mm-hmm. uh you know see so he's he's a, again a guy with um you know a, a lot of experience he's been, he's used to traveling and you know fighting other people on the home shows you know i, I know cage Warriors isn't really a home show for harilla um, yeah. but you know, he's the known quantity here. He's the guy that, uh, people have seen before. Um, but look, you know, we've, we've seen so many guys with, uh, 
you know, these guys that De Ian Dean pulls out of his little black book. And, you know, look, nobody had really heard of William Gomez before, you know. No. He was he's a training partner of uh, Saladin Parnas, who's one of the top uh, French prospects out there at the moment. But that was kind of all he was known for, you know. Yeah. Oh, it's the guy who's a training partner of uh, Parnas. And, you know, I think a lot of his fights hadn't even been under full MMA rules. Uh, and, and then, you know, you see what a great prospect he is. So I really hope we see uh, we see Gomez again back on Cage Warriors. Uh, but this is a big fight for Harilla, you know. He uh, he came in, made a, a big impression. Obviously, he's got a good amateur background, and you know, early in his pro career, he you know he's just been smashing people. Um, he got that you know that that testing against Gomez. It wasn't a thoroughly one sided fight, but as you say, um, you know, where a lot of people might have just got a bit frustrated uh, with that, he was like, oh, you know, that's a big learning experience for me, and the next time you see me, it's going to be very different. You know, Harilla's going to be one of those guys who's he's always got, going to have a sort of target on his back because he does come and make a big impression. And, you know, he does make a lot of noise in terms of his walkout. And, you know, he's got that kind of presence on social media. You know, people are going to be keeping an eye on him. So it's very important for him to, to put on a good performance here. And, you know, it's I'm not going to say it's a must-win situation for him, but I guarantee that in his mind, it is a must-win yeah. situation for him. Um, like, you know, we, we touched on briefly earlier, there's... You know, there's uh, there's two guys who've got belts in this division. There's Morgan Charrier nipping at their heels, and there's a few guys. You know, the likes of uh, you know maybe James Hendon, uh, Paul McBain, Tobias Harilla, um, and a few more guys coming up now as well. Uh, you know, Hardwick as well. He's going to be looking at 145 pound gold. You would think maybe in the next 12 to 18 months. So for it, for Harilla, it's not just about getting back in the win column. It's about putting on the kind of performance that says, well, actually, forget the rest of these guys. I'm the guy that should be fighting for the belt next. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. <sighs> right. I think uh, we'll have to wrap up now. It's been about an hour. I, there are still more fights to talk about, but um, I just give a shout, I suppose, Mike Piglack versus Steve McIntosh. Yeah, that's going to be cool as well. That's going to yeah. be a really good fight. Two strikers, yeah. both game as hell. Be a great, be a great punch up. Mm. And Aaron Abbey as well at the bottom of the card. I've just seen um, versus Samir Fadeen. Um Yeah, the former champ. That should be uh, that. That's another fight that you know is going yeah. to probably uh, help to reorder the future of the flyweight division. There's a lot going on here, man. We've, yes. I think we've, we've got eleven fights on eleven fights on Friday, ten on Saturday, um, and of course a huge UFC card as soon as we come off the air as well. So mm. if you are a fight fan next weekend. Uh, you know, make sure you've got all your uh, your bag of cans and your Haribo and whatever <laughs> other fight snacks. Don't leave the house for uh, for 48 yeah. hours. You'll have a great time. That's it. Oh, I missed the last two of the last Cage Warriors events, uh, like the two of the trilogy, because I was, I was covering Bellator Live, uh, like as press. And I was, I think I'd come back from the event, gone to the hotel, open the laptop straight away, stick on Cage Warriors. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Brad. Um, that was another cracking episode. Um, it's just got me even more excited to to, to watch uh, Double Trouble now. Yeah, no, no problem, man. Always happy to come on and have a chat. 